We're building a Derradayo. First up, we assemble everything we need. The kit, glues and tools. And we have the tools, we have the talent. Now, I loved Ghostbusters as a child. I made many a proton pack in my youth out of old cereal boxes. So out of the blocks, we have a choice. Straight legs or walking legs. I think we're going to go with the walking legs and we could give it a silly walk. <laughs> <laughs> I do miss Monty Python. You don't seem to have anyone like it anymore, do you? Anyway, let's begin the build. All right, the first thing we do is cut the first parts out. Marcel likes to use these Tamiya cutters. They are very good. Nobody does it better. Nobody does it better. Now, fun fact, The Spy Who Loved Me is probably my favorite James Bond movie. Although I do think Sean Connery was the better Bond. I do have a soft spot for Roger Moore though. And Timothy Dalton, I think he was a very good Bond. I think that Daniel Craig is very overrated. Apart from Casino Royale, I thought all his movies were a bit dull, to be honest. Also, speaking of Bond preferences, I feel the White Lotus was the best of the Bond cars even better than the DB5. But feel free to argue about that in the comments below. Now, with all the first parts all cut out of the sprue, we have these. All the parts for a foot. Now, before we stick them together, we have to clean them up. Clean, clean. I have to admit, I didn't think I would ever be referencing any Buggles songs. You are probably quite familiar with Video Killed the Radio Star, a very famous song. I think it was one of the first songs ever shown on MTV when it came out. Nowadays, they wouldn't call it Video Killed the Radio Star, would they? They would probably call it Deep Fake Killed the Video Star. And that would be a worthy sequel to that song. Maybe we should write it. I haven't played a bar chord in a long time. <laughs> to clean the parts up, Marcel begins with using Andy, the knife. He gets a lot of hate in the comments as people say he's too big. I understand how they feel. With those parts cleaned up, we have these. Lots of little foot parts. We can now glue them together. To glue the parts together, we are using Tamiya Extra Thick Cement. It's a little less messy than the standard gloopy stuff. Now, I like to swap between them depending on the situation. They both have their uses. This week, I have mostly been watching The Painting Coach. He's made a wonderful video on how to paint the Blood Ravens, a chapter which I feel I don't see enough of anymore. Go and have a look when you get a moment. No. Here we can see a part of the kit I have concerns about. The toes have a seam right down the middle, as opposed to where I feel a join should be, at the knuckle. I feel a lot of people will end up with gaps here if they're not careful. Next up, we stick the side of the foot in. These are little supporting toe things with a piston inside, I think. Here are both feet assembled. As mine's walking, I used the supporting struts stowed method for the walking leg. If it was flat on the floor like the other one, I would have the struts out. That might make sense later. Will it be a bad idea going forward? Time will tell. Remind me to buy some more sellotape. Okay, next up in the build are these two plastic dog biscuits. We glue them together and we end up with just the one wider dog biscuit. Now it's not really a dog biscuit, it's a leg part. Leg. Next up, we need this little fingertip shield. I think people use them for sewing and things. I've forgotten the real name. We then attach the fingertip shield to the dog biscuit, giving us this. I've just remembered, it's a thimble. That's the proper name. All right then. So next up, we have two halves of the lower leg and a weird looking piece, which I assume goes on the inside. I'm not sure why though. With those pieces assembled, we have the lower leg and it would appear that 
the odd part was a knee support of sorts. Appear. With those pieces assembled, we have the lower leg and it would appear that odd part was a knee support of sorts. Do you want to do this? <laughs> I assume we will find out what it does soon. Next up is this teeny tiny part. You have to be careful you don't drop and lose these sorts of things. Now carpets are notorious for eating tiny little parts like that, so be extra careful. That little panel thing fills a tiny hole in the bottom of the leg. I laid it in place and then wicked some polystyrene cement in to glue it together. It worked pretty well. Here it is glued in. You can't see any glue or seam lines. Marvellous. We also then attach our previous assembly to that lower leg, giving us a whole leg. There's still a knee pad missing though. Now the kit comes with options for knee pads. Some are bare with no detail. And some have details like sort of shields and scroll work on them. It is nice to have choices. And as they say, variety is the spice of life. The spice melange, I reckon. If any of you have got some of that they don't want, then please send it over. Oh, the sun's coming out. Suddenly got very bright. You will never guess what these parts are. Well, it's two halves of the Dreadnought's crotch. It's also a pretty easy assembly step. There's a big hole running through the middle, so make sure you don't block it up. How you might do that is beyond me, but be careful, okay? We then have what looks like a little robot with a cheesy grin on its face. Another easily losable tiny part. We attach the grinning face to the Derodeo's crotch. At least now it's attached, we can't lose it. That was right. That's right. Huh. Now I'm not really sure what this piece actually is. Some sort of venting system for the Dreadnought's crotch perhaps. Not sure why they would need that. We then have a nice big crotch flap panel. Again we get some choices, a blank one and some detailed ones. I myself prefer the blank one but your mileage may vary. With the crotch flap attached we have this. Should we paint some nice freehand on there later? We'll see. Now I do feel I need a lot more practice with freehanding. And maybe this would be a good opportunity to do it. What do you reckon? Right, we now have a few parts ready to make a big sub-assembly. In this case, the legs. I just realised we didn't show you Marcel making their second leg, did we? Well, it was pretty much the same as the first. We also have some feet too, but I think we might hold off on gluing these in until we are 100% on the base and pose. You never know what might happen. Here are the knee pads we were talking about earlier. Marcel's using two blank ones, but again, you might want to use the more detailed ones. Now, I've never really been a fan of sculpted on detail. I find it makes miniatures look a bit too busy or toy-like or something. It's really hard to explain. What do you guys reckon? Do you like your sculpted on detail? Or do you like your sort of plain blank look? With those knee pads glued on, we have this. Now I guess I won't be painting my knee pads separately anymore. I forgot about that. No oh well. We can see it easily fits on the supplied base. I think this one is an 80mm round base. Apparently the dreadnoughts won't stand up until I glue the feet in. Who knew? Now I've got an interesting idea for basing coming up, but you're going to have to wait until the painting video to see that. Actually it might be the one after it because I'll probably separate them out with jazz hands apparently. Next up we have what looks like a plastic toilet seat and a small part to attach to it somewhere. With that part attached we have what looks like another little robot face. Little. Is it normal to see faces and everything? These are not plastic worms. Oh no, these are tiny little cables that we need to attach to the toilet seat part. Again, these parts are easily lost, so keep your eye on them at all times. Those pipes attach on the sides. They only attach in a specific way, so don't worry about putting them on the wrong side. If cock-ups like that can be made, you can be damn certain that I'll be the one to do it. Every bloody time. So I have to admit, I'm not sure what this clip of the legs is doing here. I think we should have seen this a lot earlier on, when we were building the legs. Hmm. Anyway, 
Another mistake here. I forgot to show you the parts needed to make this. It's not a multi-melter. I think it's the Dreadnought's exhaust pipes. We then need to acquire a couple more dress-up pieces for the exhaust pipes. A cover thing and what looks a bit like a car's alternator. With all those parts assembled, we have this. It still looks a bit like a multi-melter to me. I suppose multi-melters and exhausts are quite similar things really, aren't they? Just a pipe with hot air coming out of the end. One of them is just hotter than the other. Well, I think that's how they work. I'm sure if I'm wrong, someone will let me know in the comments below. Oh. Don't tell the hospital as we appear to have acquired someone's granny's new hip joint parts. These are ball and socket pieces. All those get glued onto the side of the exhaust assembly. Those two holes either side are for magnets, I think, to allow you to swap weapons. Nice touch. Now I did consider magnetizing mine, but I think I might just build an entire new Doredio for the other weapon options. A long way down the road. Not too worried about gaming meta at the moment and weapon choosing. Let's just go with what we think looks nice. This teardrop shaped piece here is the head holder. And I guess you could call it a neck. This neck piece attaches to the previous toilet seat assembly, giving us the look of the old Manta Force toy from the early 90s. Did any of you have one of those, or did I just dream it up? Okay, so I have to admit the build gets a little what you might call difficult here, and mistakes can be made if you're not careful. Right, so we get to choose top plates. Again, we went with the blank one, and yet again, your mileage may vary. Pick which one you like most. We then glue the two halves of the top plate onto the toilet assembly. Be really careful here. Take your time and dry fit it. Check all the joins as you can end up with a lot of gaps if you're not careful. We've got a few here which we need to tidy up later. All the ones I've seen people make of this new kit have this gap, so don't worry too much if you get them. Next up, it's another set of small parts. Can you guess what we're assembling this time? And if you guessed heavy bolters, you guessed correctly. Again, these have holes in for weapons swapping options. You might want to pick the heavy flamer option. There's also this piece, the Dreadnought's Alice Band. This is another easily lost piece and goes behind the Dreadnought's head. As I'm an idiot, I didn't film it attached, so please feel free to report me to the hobby police. Those heavy bolters attach to the underside of the toilet assembly. I've found they're a snug fit, so you can easily swap them out without using magnets. Handy. Now I used to be a big fan of magnetizing, but not so much these days. I do wonder why that is. I think I just prefer the miniatures for the painting and modeling side of things rather than just having weapon options for gaming. I think we talked about this before. We have a few more parts up next. These are going to be the weapon housings for the Dreadnought's arms. When they are assembled, they look like this. I'm not sure what the little flaps are for. They look like American post boxes. They just need the little flag that pops out. Now you always used to see paper boys on their bikes in America throwing the old newspaper across the yard of the house. It was always in 80s movies, wasn't it? Did that actually used to happen or is it just a movie trope? Next up, it's the parts to make a pair of robotic elf shoes. Just in time for Christmas, I reckon. This one was a simple assembly. It's literally just two halves to stick together. There's no nasty join or seam afterwards, which is nice. Oh, by the way, in this build, some things actually are built in pairs. I just wanted to show you one of each of the pairs so I wasn't repeating myself and showing you everything twice. You're free to rewind it and watch those sections twice though if you fancy it. It's weapons time. We've decided to go with the plasma gun thing with a weird name, as Marcel's fancies having a go at painting plasma effects later. What? There's no S on my name. <laughs> what? As Marcel fancies... Oh, as Marcel fancies having a go at painting plasma effects later, only three parts to build the main body of these. 
Those two side panels, when attached, do look very good. The seams and joins are quite well hidden, and like a lot of gun barrels out there, I'm looking at you, Imperial Knight Battle Cannon. We then have these weird looking things and a lens. These, when put together, form the attachment point for the weapon. Here we can see those attachment points added to the weapon. I think those holes again can be used for magnetizing, but again, you will find they just push in nicely and snugly. Next up are these pipes. Be careful when cleaning these up, it's easy to cut the attachment points off. They go together very simply, although they feel fragile and we need to hold them while they dry. Leaning them on the table might end up with a bend at the join. What Marcel has done is just poke the assembly into a big blue tack blob. That will hold it vertical until it's dry. My husband's very clever. I'm so lucky to have him. She's not wrong. Now I use blue tack for a lot of things. It's really quite handy, you know? But it's a pain in the arse when you get it in the carpet. It's really hard to get out. So hard, in fact, there's even a section on their website telling you how to get blue tack out of the carpet. Here's what the weapons look like when they're fully assembled. Mine are not glued together, I'm just holding them in place for your viewing pleasure. Again, like before, there were two sets of the main weapon to build, and to prove I did make both, here's a little clip. Okay, so we're moving on to the missile launcher now. It's called a ravioli or areola launcher or something. First up, a couple of casing parts. These go together really well with some wicked in thin polystyrene cement. I think that nub there is for the weapon's elevation mechanism later. Next up we have the other side of the casing, this time it's the uppermost panels. Again they go together really well with the cement wicking method. There's no visible seams or joins. It's wonderful. Now I'm assuming you guys know what wicking in cement means. If not, just let me know and we'll do a little video on it at some point. Explaining what we're doing and why we do it. Now we have to assemble those casing parts along with a little grill or vent looking thing for the rear. That went together quite easily, although this is one of those pieces you can end up with gaps in if you're not paying attention. So pay attention, I guess. Here's a ceiling from that trap room scene in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, a scene that scared Marcel as a youngster. I'm still scared of it now. It's actually a missile rack thing, but I think you knew that. Inserting the missiles into the front of the case and finished off the missile pods. Again, there were two of these, but there's still more to go until this sub-assembly is finished. Now we didn't get the parts to make the other weapon pod options. A shame, I feel. I know the other options in the old rules were like a big rack of missiles and some sort of shield generator device, like an umbrella. Does that thing have rules in Heresy 2.0? Can't say I've looked. Okay, so here we have some tiny little parts. Again, that little nub piece is really small, so be careful when you remove it from the sprue. The carpet doesn't need feeding today. Assembling those parts gives us this, a little radar dish thing. I'm never sure if that nub is meant to be a lens or just a nub. What is it supposed to be? Do any of you know? There are some more parts for the nub holder next. One of these parts are really fragile. There's a tiny little aerial part sticking out of the top, so be careful with that one. You don't want to snap it. With those parts assembled, we then have to attach a little top hat looking piece. I think this is the spindle for the missile pod to rotate on. This is what those parts look like when they're assembled. You don't want to glue these assemblies together as they move. All you have to do is push fit the nub part into the holder. Now it can elevate and descend, perfect for tracking nasty flying enemies like seagulls and your neighbour's drones. Now I'm not sure what this missile launcher's role in game actually is, you know. Is it more an anti-infantry weapon or anti-tank? It's pretty easy to assemble the missile pod. Just push the launchers into the side of the nub thing. 
be careful where you put your glue so you don't end up sticking it in and it can't move. We always like to give our moving parts a bit of a wiggle after gluing just to be sure we haven't accidentally glued them solid. Marcel's done it many, many times. He never learns. Now, if you can think of a mistake, you can be damn sure I've done it multiple times. Next, we stick the Derrideo's ears in. Those pieces with the American letterboxes from before. Do they have a proper name? I hope it's not just letterbox. Here, they are attached. It's got proper little stubby arms now, like a T-Rex. <laughs> Has anyone ever painted their space marines in a dinosaur colour scheme? One like the old Jeeps in Jurassic Park would be quite cool. Either of them, the green and red ones or the grey and orangey coloured ones. Both are pretty good, but they're not dinosaurs, are they? Silly me. A few days ago, we visited the Snakeworks in-laws for a mid-autumn festival. I was landed the task of lighting 1456 lanterns, and not once did I burn my hand, and I was quite pleased with myself. Which one? Oh, this one. <laughs> Say cheese! Cheese! It's time to give the Dreadnought a head. Again, we get a choice of parts with either scroll work and details, or just blank, like the one we are using here. We have another irritating join here, right down the centre of the face, which again we need to be careful when gluing. The Dreadnought's head is tired now, after a hard day of assembly, so he's having a rest on the blue tack pillow. I'm hoping we took care of the join well enough. Now it's always possible to go back in at the end, and fill any gaps in with green stuff or putty of some sort. Also, if you want to get your hands on your own Derrideo Dreadnought, then check out the link up here somewhere. I'll also put one down in the description below for you. Here's an interesting little detail I've found. The instructions show the kit built with one of each of the main weapons. I'm pretty sure that's not a viable loadout in game, so be careful here. There's nothing stopping you doing it if you do think it looks cool though. Right, here we can see all the sub-assemblies ready for final assembly. I'm going to keep it like this for ease of painting though and just blue tack it together. Here's what the Dreadnought looks like all blue tacked together in a janky pose. It's very top heavy and it keeps wanting to fall apart. A bit like me after a couple of shandies. Now we're almost ready for paint but we have one more thing to tackle. The base. Now if you want to come and discuss basing your miniatures then please come and check out our friendly Discord, which is not behind a paywall. Again, there's a little link up here somewhere, and I'll put another one down in the description below. We look forward to seeing you there. Let's get basing. For the base, we wanted some duck boards and some sort of post or light beside them. It's inspired by a movie, but I will let you try to guess which one you think it was. After a little fiddling and rummaging around my bits, but... <laughs> After a little fiddling and rummaging around my bits box, Marcel created this. <laughs> Shut up. I'm trying to work here. After a, after a little fiddling and rummaging around my bits box, Marcel created this. Marcel had to make a smaller post as the other one was too big and rubbed up against the dreadnought. That was no good. All that's left now is to stick the Dreadnought on it. Now while we put our paints away, I just want to give a massive shout out to all our Patrons and channel members. Dan Gallup, Lee Blackley, Donald, Pine Tree, Bobzilla, Charles Marlowe, Andrew Marrington, Dr. Lee, and our newest member, Nick Ellingham. Thank you all so, so much. We love you all. We do indeed. Now before we check out the finished article, I just wanted to show you my new Bits box. It's actually made from an old Morrison's Mink Chop Chip ice cream tub, and I think I said mink. It's not mink, it's mint. Anyway, inside I keep all my bits, funnily enough. As you can see there, oh there's a note. What does that note say? It says please like and subscribe. That means you, Henry. If you are enjoying the content on the channel, then please consider joining us on Patreon, the link to which is in the description below or up here somewhere. 
Also, please remember that Mrs. Snakeworks said that when we hit 10,000 subscribers, we can get a Warhound to Titan. So please subscribe and we can hold her to that. Okay, without further ado, let's check out the finished article, shall we? So here it is. What a beast. The fully assembled Derradeo Dreadnought with Hellfire Plasma Cannonade. I think it looks great and I cannot wait to get some paint on it. Building it was an absolute breeze, although there were a few panels I felt had a bit too much of a chance of getting gaps in. I think we did the best we can though. In the next video we should be painting this dreadnought up, so we look forward to seeing you there. I cannot wait to get started. If you want to see some more videos in this Horus Heresy series, then check out the playlist up here somewhere. And as always, thank you very much for watching.